Blog Talk Radio. Peace to everyone out there in Blog Talk Radio land. I hope you've had a productive week. Uh, we're here from Entheogenic with the Entheogenic Explorer Program, and I'm your host, uh, Baba Kalindi E. and we're going to have a special show this evening, uh, and we're going to be talking about Yiming Zhu, the glowing crystals, the ones that uh, people are talking about as the uh, true infinity stones, and we have a special guest that's going to uh, clue us in on some of the intricacies of the evening zoo, Peter Andreas. So we're looking forward to, we uh, had a little bump in the road a couple of weeks ago, but um, we should be here and ready to roll shortly. Um, Thank everyone for chiming in and being part of the show. Um, That's what we, we do here. We, are the ones who talk about and deal with psychedelics, entheogens, and the hallucinogens. So um, what does that have to do with the Yiming Zhu crystals and things like that? Well, the Yiming Zhu crystals are an accessible quantum mechanical device that pairs with the theogens very, very um, intimately so they can be used during your trip. So while we're waiting for our uh, guests to chime in and for us to uh, be able to discuss and uh, let you know more about uh, these crystals, which we've talked about for um uh, since the program's been coming on since uh, since March, um, uh, he's going to share with you uh, some of the uh, some of the things that um, folks may not really really know about, uh, and you know give us some insight into what they do. So um, we're looking forward to him coming in in a minute or two. And that's going to be a one. It's going to be a wonderful show. He's our he's our first guest, and um, as I said, and uh, I've been saying on the program that we're going to start bringing in guests on the subjects of uh, things dealing with entheogens and the history uh, of them, and moving into our our very near future dealing with all of the different types of, um, you know, technologies and things that are part of the entheogenic world because it's what's driving the um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other things that we're right in the midst of here um, in the, the very first part of the 20th century here, 21st century, excuse me. Um, so we need to to be very very clear on how these things can help us and what we're we're moving into uh, things like the Internet of Things and dealing with cryptocurrencies rather than fiat currency and uh, things like this. So we're we're in the we're in the in the midst of it, and we need tools. We need tools and weapons and armor to protect ourselves and put us um, on a, on an equal footing and ahead of the game in this thing when we're dealing with so much that's uh, pertinent in our world as far as um, where we are. So um, the Yi Ming Zhu is a great tool. We'll be talking about it um, pretty much through the whole show. And we're, we're glad to have um, our special guests uh, coming in and uh, chiming in and uh, talking about and giving a history of and 
you know, being able to share with us exactly what uh, is going on with that. So, um, uh, yeah, it's great, uh, great info that will be shared this evening. Um, also, I have a lecture coming up this well tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the city of Detroit for those who are in the area on AI, well, Bitcoin, AI, and the, and the 5G Internet of Things. And we'll be talking about uh, artificial intelligence. We'll be talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Uh, if you aren't in, why not? Um, the 5G of Things where we have all of the different types of um, uh, smart everythings from pill bottles to smart juice boxes to smart refrigerators to smart shoes and all of those different types of things where, you know, you walk and your shoes tell you, of course, it's relating to your phone and telling you, uh, you know, uh, how much you've, uh, how much you've done as far as movement throughout the day and things like this. And I believe this is our, uh, guest uh, chiming in. Let me see. Are you uh, there? Kalindi. How are I you? Hear, brother. Good morning. Good. How are you? <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. We're not going to reveal where you are, but good morning. <laughs> How's well, it going? I'm, I'm in Taipei. I'm in Taipei <laughs> in there. The, the day is just beginning. The day is just beginning. Well, that's good. Um, like to welcome you to Boy, the show. The... Outside, so it's, it's windy. <laughs> it's rainy. It's cold. Oh man. <laughs> well, you know where you know where uh, where I am in Detroit here. So it's windy and nasty and cold. So um, it's a lot like should... Detroit, except everybody's <laughs> Chinese. Yeah, you should probably probably be <laughs> probably be in some place like. Uh, uh, Bangkok or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but um, or somewhere tropical, somewhere tropical, somewhere warm. Well, they say it'll yeah. be warm next week, but I don't know. <clears throat> you know yeah, it's a very uh, it's a it's an island in the middle of, middle of the Pacific. We get typhoons and earthquakes and all sorts of good things. Yes, yes. Well, I'm glad you can make it to the show. Um, you're you're our actual first guest on the show. So, uh, it's only fitting that you be the first guest. We, uh, Peter and I have known each other for more than 40 years. And just to give you a little bit of background with me, you know, he's the one who actually, uh, gave me my first, uh, entheogens of the mushroom exposure exposure. You know, I'd had some acid before then, but you know, the mushrooms, uh, uh, a little, uh, uh, well, really a lot different, but I always give him his props uh, in dealing with that. <laughs> always yeah, give him his props uh, on, on doing, on, on, on that. And that was, those were some, some great times. And, uh, so here we are. Um, also Peter is the person who introduced me to the, the Yi Ming Zhu. And so I, I guess we can get right off into it. Um, maybe just give a little a little background about yourself and uh, uh, just let the audience know what's uh, what's going on. Well, um, I first discovered uh, Ye Ming Ju and the term is a Chinese term for a family of minerals, crystals, and gems that are able to glow in the dark on their own volition once they've been energized and they've been revered by Chinese emperors for millennia and I was a golf professional that's what brought me to Asia and I was actually teaching golf in Guilin in southwestern China back in 2009 early 2009 to the director of a provincial mineral museum and after our first lesson, we were in his, in his study, and it was all these beautiful crystals and, you know, 
rosewood furniture, Chinese scrolls on the wall, very beautiful, you know, a lot of antiquities and, and fine things. And we're kind of in, a, in the dark because we've been in the sun for two hours getting baked on the driving range. Mm-hmm. And his assistant comes in and she puts this round river stone about the size of a skipping stone on okay. the table and she pours hot water on it and this thing lights up and it's glowing in the dark turquoise kind of turquoise blue green and I've never seen anybody pour water on a rock and have it glow in the dark I'm like I'm just like I'm just, it's just, <laughs> I'm just you, am I what? tripping <laughs> what is that and uh, she had a master's in geology and she explained to me as well as she could. She says it's called the Yaming Jew, and she says there was they they all also known as the Dragon's Pearl, and that it was owned by Chinese emperors, and it contains rare earth elements, which give it its glowing feature. And uh, I just had this. I was flabbergasted. I was just stunned. And so if you've ever been to, to China or Southeast Asia, the, 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 the hygiene is not quite the same as it is in, especially this is kind of rural China. Guilin is southwestern China. It's not like, I guess Shanghai, Beijing is going to be yeah. probably quite a bit better. But I, I'm always, I find myself, because I'm not from there, I'm always kind of fighting off the cooties because, you know, when you're eating the food there, they don't have the, whether it's the microbes yeah. or whatever. So I, I kind of had a little swelling under each behind, you know, the, the lymph nodes at the, at the TMJ joint where the jaw meets the ear. Yeah. A little, little, little puffiness, a little bit of discomfort. And I picked the stone and I just intuitively just placed it there. And it just like, it just sucked the, the pain away. The pain went away. The swelling went down. It was like, it was instant. And I put it on the other side. I said, whoa, that's interesting. She says, put it outside in the sunshine. So I put it on a white piece of paper and I took it out on a little portico and I stuck it in full bright sunlight for like 10 minutes. And I bought it inside and it was brilliant white, the light. It was brilliant. And I spent the next two and a half hours drinking tea and using this Yemen Jew as kind of like a healing stone. And I went down, I wiped all my meridians. I went down any part of my body that had any kind of stuck energy, any blocked energy or any kind of congestion or anything. I used it like a, like a, almost like a vacuum cleaner. And it like sucked away the cooties and, and filled it with the energy. And I, when I left there about five o'clock in the afternoon, I felt like I was wearing electricity. I was just tingling with energetic aliveness. I just, I was just, I was just in, you know, put me in the zone. I was just was, I mean, I'll never forget that day. And the place Did it help your golf game? This place, <laughs> the place where this happened was, uh, this was in, this was on the 20th of April, 2008. And so it, that night on the ride back to, to my house, I had a 90-minute bus ride from Guilin back to Yangshou. So I'm in, and so where I stay was where the Li River and the, and the Yulong River meet. And it's a very, the, the mountains kind of look like meatloaf. They're kind of like very, very, you know, very interesting landforms. And the, the area is famous for its, its, its caves and its, and its mineral well. Mm-hmm. And they say that that area is the that's the legendary birthplace of the dragon. So they they find a lot of Yemen Jew there. And that night I had dreams of going into these caves. I mean, I dreamed of Yemen Jew that well that that night never night since actually. But about three months later, I was able to acquire that Yemen Jew from them. I traded him quite a bit of money. And free golf lessons. And the man who sent me to Asia was Tiger Woods' father, Earl, who was my mentor. 
And in Asia, your lineage, who your teacher is, carries a tremendous amount of weight. Yes. And because yes, I was definitely. on some extent a lineage holder from this line, that was something that he found very valuable. So he was able to trade this this image from their collection. And as soon as I got possession of it, it's like the universe flipped the switch and my life changed. The life I have now is bears scant. It's like it's so different. I'm on another level. It just it put me to another level entirely. It changed my life completely. And I found that as soon as I got the treasure stone, the things that Chinese say in terms of the myths and legends about Yiming Ju, I found them to be true. It's my own experience. And about a month and a half after that, this was like July, some small 14 millimeter Yiming Ju pearls showed up, became available, and I got three. Mm -hmm. And so, because, you know, when you're not from China, when you're a foreigner, you're fair game. It's like, it's not personal, it's structural. <laughs> they don't tell yes. you anything. And there's nothing written about you. So when I went, you know, I went, on, I've been, I went online that first night and tried to find something about Yin and Ju. And it, there's, there, was very, there was very little information about it. Most of it was like superstition, legends and superstition. And, um, you know, there's very, very, there was not much info at all. In, in English and um, so I just had to so it picked my interest I wanted to find out you know what, what, what what's the real deal where is it what is it really where is it from what's the real history of it? what's the geology what's the chemistry you know how does it glow and as soon as I got this these three pearls I had a, a street artist kind of did the macrame make me an, my first energy armor and it was a bracelet on each wrist with the, with the pearl and, uh, a, and, a, and a necklace so I, would, I could either wear it dangling over my sternum or I could cinch it and wear it over my third eye like it you know like it's, it's, oh yeah it's like, like, a a, like a band yeah yeah like a band, band. Head, like a headband yeah and uh, as soon as I put it on and walked downstairs, and where I stayed in Young Show, I stayed at the sixth floor, and there's no elevators. So you know, going up to my room and coming back down, you get you get a workout. You know, and, and the pitch of the stairs is kind of steep, so you really get an aerobic workout. So when I came downstairs, my first day wearing this energy arm, and I opened the door, looking out, it looked like I was underwater. And the air was sparkling. It was, I could see all the bions, what Wilhelm White calls the bions, like sparkling, the sparkling yeah. light, like look like flies in the air. And that's how the world looks when I eat magic mushroom. You start to when I do when I'm dead magic mushrooms, you know, but in my youth, the first thing I would see was the energy dimension that you kind of swim in. You could see it. Yeah. And the the when the image you put me into a satori state. And I've been in this Satori state since, since July 2009. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. that's, now that's that's, a, that's the base. That's the discipline. That's the square one now. That's fasc that's that's fascinating. It just, it just and you you've written a book also. You you you've written a written a book also, haven't you? The only one well, in English. I, uh, well, let, let me just. I, let me just tell you how that came about. It's like I okay. started wearing this energy arm 24-7. I'd wear it during the day. I'd sleep in it. And then I got a little, another couple of pearls, and I put one, you know, right over my over my uh, my belt buckle. So I'd have my, my lower down chin would be, anchored, would be armored. And I got two more small ones that I put on my shoes, and so my feet were anchored. And I'm walking around, and I'm wearing energy. It felt like I'm wearing electricity. That's what it feels like when you're wearing, when you're wearing when you're arm when you completely when you have your all your major chakras have yimings you to enhance their field strength. And on December first, two thousand nine, I played a round of golf in Chiang Mai, which is where my winter home is. And I had a bit of a headache. I was feeling a little bit off. So I, I put the Yemen Jew up over my third eye. I'd never played golf with my Yemen Jew on before because over my third eye. And as soon as I put it over my third eye, 
it put me into a state they call open focus, where I had yes. a broad panoramic view in crystal clear detail, rather than like looking through a, a, a like a, a sight of a, of a of a telescope, where you get like a narrow field of, of vision that's in sharp detail, the whole field like panoramic 180, my you know, peripheral vision all the way from the front to my sides, huge field, crystal clear detail. And I stepped to the team, and I saw this shot, and they call this edetic, like it's like a, a, a uh, synesthesia where it's it's not just sight, it's feelings, it's it's it's, 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 it's all all the senses are working together as one and enhanced. And so I saw this shot in crystal clear detail, and I could see the flight of the ball, and I could see the spot 300 yards away down the middle of fair with this little green patch where the ball lay before I hit it. And I stepped up to the tee and I took the club back. And I mean, I've done this before. I've been experiencing playing golf in the zone since I was 14. But this is something, this is heightened. And that day I saw every shot in crystal clear, lucid, like 4D, so super vivid detail and hit it exactly as I saw it from the first tee to the last, from the first shot to the last shot. I have never played better. I can't play any better. I shot 63, but I should have should have shot 53 because the greens were so bumpy because it was a local course. The greens had been aerated. But they, when they, they'll, they'll take this machine, they'll try to plug, uh, dig uh, holes in it to kind of perforate the soil to let the you know, to get the, the, the excess moisture out. And, and that's it. And then they cover the greens with sand so it's not a smooth surface. But I've never hit the ball better. And the last shot I hit, I can't hit a golf ball better than that. And I was a tour player. I played in the Asian tour. I played in mini tours. I was an approved, a tournament player in the Aloha section in Hawaii. So I can play a little bit. I'm not great, but I was good. But this is something, this is not, this is something altogether. This is another, I just, I've never played better. I can't play better. When I finished that round of golf, after that last shot, I hit a four iron, 230 yards, to a tight, on a par five, 18th hole, to a tight pin. It was like on a two tier green. It was, the pin was in the back, very, very small landing area. And this shot, it looked like a, looked like a jet take, looked like an F 14 take off. <laughs> the feeling impact was like lightning. I mean, I still feel it. It was uh, just the finest shot I've ever hit, ever. And it hit right in the face of the, the right before the second tier, and, and it kind of tumbled over the edge and curled down next to the hole for like, like a kicking, like a foot away for a tapping eagle. And after that round, it laid behind the green, and my body was, I had so much chi, I was, I was, it was, it was ecstasy. And I retired from golf that day. I quit at the top, and since that day, since December 1st, 2009, I put all my focus in figuring out what in the world is this. Because mm. I was so you quit, my so you quit at the, energy. You say you quit at the top. I quit at the top. The greatest shot of the greatest shot. I had I had, I had, I had, I had you on each wrist on the back of each wrist, and I had one over my third eye, and it was like I it. it I, it was be, I was beyond the zone. I played in the zone before. This was beyond the zone. I was in it. Because the, the interesting thing about it is my mind was so still. It was no thought. I was, I was just like observing the observer. It was higher than the zone. It was beyond it was something else. And so my research since that time has been to figure out what in the, you know, what was that? And what she aiming you to be able to facilitate that? And that's how the book came about. That's what inspired the book. The book came out of that experience. Okay. That's yeah. the motivation for it. Yes, I, re- I remember. Long. Yeah, I remember. I mean, I've I read the book. It's it's fascinating, and it. it gives a lot of questions to me dealing with martial arts and things like that. Because I remember the old. Kung Fu movies. Uh, uh, I think some of the 
old movies, they would have a disc band over the third eye when they were doing martial arts. And I, and I know, well, of course, they were, they were real was in the Kung Fu movie, but I was just thinking that that may have been uh, in the actual, from the, from the legend, the Yi Ming Zhu. And I also remember um, when I was watching the movie, uh, The Last Emperor of China, um, the Dawisha Empress, when she died and he was to become the emperor, um, they took oh, a, yeah. a, a yeah. small round um, Yi Ming Zhu and put it in her mouth. You know, I remember that yes. from the from the movie. You know, I said, well, that's what they put in her mouth when they when the last emperor, you know, the last emperor of China. That movie, you know, because it was a, a, a great movie. But uh, I remember that vividly. And um, yeah, well, that, um, was that they, one of the things that the, they would my, do also? Well, that that particular her name is Su Shi. And I used to pronounce it sushi, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like sushi food. <laughs> when you do that Chinese will roll on it, that's hilarious. That's the, you know, because it, it's a tonal language, so we see it one way, and it's like, you know, if you don't get the tones right, it, it means something else completely different. But sushi yeah. was the the uh, Dowager Empress, and she had, as a, she was a Qing Dynasty Empress. She's Manchu. Yes, and I've come to learn that those Yemen Jews in 1948, those are imperial Yemen Jews, were actually taken from China as part when when Chiang Kai Shek fled China in 1948. They took the finest of the finest imperial treasures not just gold not just silver not just the imperial jade not just the fine porcelain and the fine bronzes and all the all the other you know uh, imperial treasure from the, uh, the household yeah. they also took the the most valuable thing for the yemen jew and uh i was very lucky to meet in 2010 i met a Taoist master He's a Taoist priest here in Taiwan named Master Yang. And he, he was a, uh, a very renowned Yemen Jew dealer. And he had a Taoist tea circle Monday through Friday, 2 to 6, at his showroom. And I met him uh, at the uh, weekend jade market in Taipei. And when we met, we recognized each other. You ever have that where you meet somebody you've never met before, but you just like, as soon as you, make, as soon as you see them, you say, oh, you, it's you, right? Yes, and, uh, definitely. He'd been seeing me, he's been seeing me in his medi- he'd been seeing me in his meditation for two years before I showed up. So when we met, we like, we're like, we like, you know, we clicked. We're like brothers from the, from the jump street, but he spoke very little English. I spoke very little Chinese, but we could communicate. Well, nonetheless, we could communicate. And... He invited me to this Dallas Tea Circle, and it was between six and eight, eight regulars that would come to the Tea Circle. All of them are da- were Taoists, Chinese, from t- in Taiwan, and they're all Yemen Jew collectors and connoisseurs. And every day they would bring different Yemen. It was like show and tell. And so I was able to meet a lot of the people that. You know, the heavy aiming Jew, the you know, love aiming Jew, and learn a lot of the, the stories, the culture, and the, you know, and the things associated with the art, you know, the, the spiritual practices, the meditative practices associated with the aiming Jew, as well as all the different varieties of the aiming Jew. And, but it's interesting, I first was, I first was introduced to the aiming Jew over tea. So there's some connection between tea, the tea culture, the art of tea, and the aiming Jew. They're like uh, qigong and in, in, in tea are like the best of friends. Yes, but, uh, yes I know from the kung fu uh, guys. One of the that. people <laughs> at this one of the men at this tea circle, one of the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the, the, the 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 group. I didn't realize it at the time. Was a member of the last royal family of China. Hmm. And he, the liking to he just I mean he. He took a, a shine to me, but he had me he had me vetted first. He 
did he did a, did a background check on me before he revealed himself. And he came to the tea circle one day, and he had this little, small little bag. It's actually from Tiffany's, and inside is a Tiffany box. And he has this sheath, sheath of uh, it's like a roll of, uh, you know, when you send uh, papers through the through the mail, something you don't want to damage. It's like a it's like a cylinder. It'll have stoppers on both ends. Yeah. So yeah. If you yeah, put a, I know what like a poster tube, a small poster tube, and he, he opens this thing up, and he's got. It's 22 pages of provenance. And he opens this box up. He's got this small demon Jew about this size. A little bit bigger than a golf ball. Smaller than a billiard ball, bigger than a golf ball. About an inch and a half in diameter. Mm -hmm. And this is the twin of the Yemen Jew that they showed in the last emperor of China that they put in her mouth. Yes. This was the twin. Every emperor from the Ming Dynasty to the end of the Qing Dynasty, that's 24 emperors, had a matched pair of Yi Ming Ju. Every emperor. That means just 24 emperors, each have two, 48 imperials. So he had, this is one of those 48. He had that was like a national that, treasure. Always, it's, it's, it's more than that. Yeah, beyond the um, national treasure. He had it's, it's true antiquity, and it's and it's a it's an imperial treasure. It's an imperial treasure stone. And as soon as he hands this Yemen Jew to me, and I hold it in my hand, do you remember the in, in the first Star Trek movie when when three CPO makes it over to like Obi Wan Kenobi and and, he, and they they tap him and all of a sudden this hologram appears and it's like Princess Leia. Oh, yes. Obi Wan, come help us! You know. It, Yes. I hold yes. the Yemen Jew. And it had. It was like. It was like a hard drive. I didn't realize it was like a DVD player. But when I held the Yemen Jew, all of a sudden I'm someplace else. All of a sudden I'm in the Forbidden City. And there's people moving around me in period dress. So I'm back in the Ming Dynasty. This is the Ming Dynasty Yemen Jew, because. It recorded everything that its owner had experienced it while it was holding him, it. And so when I held the Amen Jew, I was able to access its Akashic memory, but it's playing it back as a visual memory file. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, I know exactly what you're Akashic saying. <laughs> this, is very, this is a very illustrious, this is a very intelligent, this is a very high... In, in terms of the Yeming Jew pantheon, this is one of the Imperials. There's only 48. And this particular one was one of the best, was, you know, the cream of the crop, the top of the crop. It had more, more memory than the others because it hit, because of its particular history. So I'm holding this Yeming Jew. And I'm, I can, I'm still aware that I'm, because I'm at the Dallas Tea Circle, there's people, walk, you know, they're, they're drinking tea, and there's, they're, they're, I'm still faintly aware of them in the background, but my main awareness, what's more vivid to me, is what, is is where I'm, where I'm being reliving or being shown, and as I tune into the frequency, when I, as I tune into this Yin and Jew, it takes me then back to Orion. I'm out in the star field, which is where the rare earths come from. So it's communicating. It's, it, it's revealing itself to me. It's just meeting me. It never met me before. And so it, I went from the forbidden city to the, out into the cosmos where I'm looking at Orion from out in space. And then it took me into the Akashic. It's Akashic memory. And the way I can describe it, you've seen the Matrix when 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 Neil was looking down, you know, towards the, you know the into the Matrix, and you can see the, you know, the, their 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 digits, the numbers that are that are railing down like the coding, the yeah, the code, the the codes, yeah. yeah. The coding is going down. So I'm someplace. I'm in the Akashic memory, and there's eight avenues. There are eight lanes. 
and all the coding that's coming down to Chinese characters. And they're, 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 they are gold. The field is kind of green, but they're gold on it. And they're just cascading down like a waterfall. Simultaneous, I'm seeing these eight pathways. And then it introduces me. There's a family. This is one Yaming Jew. They're all connected like a computer. This is just one terminal. There's a, there's a collective memory of everything they've experienced. Is, is they're, is they're conveying. So I got the, the, I saw the big picture, the gestalt. And all of a sudden, then I'm back. And, it, and all of a sudden, I'm back. I'm like, I'm like, I've been gone for like 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And You're in the network. He's like, he, he didn't say anything to me. He just handed me the aiming Jew. He showed me the provenance and handed me the aiming Jew. And then, boom, I went on this. I had this experience. And so I'm the first Westerner to be able to, the first non-Chinese to be able to touch one of these. From yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's fascinating. But I found the same so that, type that was, of information. That was like, that's great. That was, that was an eye-opener. That was an eye-opening experience. So that was like, that was from this ancient imperial that had all these memories. And um, that was on the 20th of June, 2010. And I think the solstice was the next day. And so that was, that, that gave me the next bit of information because after that meeting after that after I handed the image back to him this royal who now has kind of taken me under his wing is explaining to me about the miracle of activation because this image was activated so it has all these capabilities you can use it to like traverse to travel? Yes, yes, yes. That's because the Xi'an Jew has been cultivated for centuries, right? <laughs> this is, in, you know, the emperors have been, this has been, this is an emperors were holding this. And they would hold the Yemen Jew like, you know, during the, all day long, they have it during affairs of state, during when they're sleeping. When, I mean, they had the Yemen Jew. They were constantly holding the, the two Yemen Jews, like a bowling ball. Like the ones you see in the in the Chinatown, yeah, the, you can they they have yeah, the, roll them in their hands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about uh, it. So yeah. this was about them all. And so they had each had a pair and they and they had their image with them twenty four pretty much twenty four seven. They'd sleep with them. And so so there was so much there was so much content. There's so much information, there's so much chi in this one particular Yaming Jew. It, it had it had activated a long time ago. And he explained to me about the miracle of activation. Because that's where my focus is now, is really getting to understand that that really is the name of the game. That, that what and Jew is, is an energy gem. It's, according to Dr. Patrick Flanagan, who's one of the most renowned uh, scientists of this era. Yeah. Many people think he's the reincarnation of Nikola Tesla. Yeah, yeah yes. a neurophone he, and the other I, thing, pyramid I, power. I gave him a, uh, a, some Yemen Jew uh, spheres for, to research, and the first thing he says, he's holding in his hand, he's looking at me, he says, oh, I know what this is. He says, this is a hyperdimensional dielectric field capacitor, because he's a physicist. He's looking at it like that's what it is. I said, he said, I said, what? He says it's a crystal. He says it's a crystal Tesla coil. It's a scalar crystal. And so that, as I research this, that's where my focus now is: is understanding what scalar energy, what scalar energy is, how scalar energy, scalar waves work, the capabilities of scalar, and it goes a long way to explain the, you know, the proper use of the and Jew, the miracle of the and Jew, and, and where beyond the zone is. Is that too much, too soon? No, 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 
That's okay. uh, that's great right. because a lot of the things you're talking about, I'm I'm right with. You know, the I I, I call them um the the true true quantum computers because like when you said you you it 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 took you to the place you downloaded the information or you 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 phased with the information of the uh, of the Yiming Zoo's uh, memory banks. So to be able to record and then to be able to release that um, that information back, that's just basically what a computer is. Now, they're on a, a completely different level as far as, um, you know, as far as the, the whole thing of, uh, of, of the quantum computers, what they're trying to actually do uh, with the quantum computers like D-Wave and, and others are what at room temperature – the Yiming the, the Yiming Zoo do already. See, they have quantum computers, but they have to, you know, f- uh, freeze them, dog, <laughs> freeze that chip down to almost absolute zero, or it would explode because of the heat, because they have not heat problems. But the natural um, uh, energy of the Yiming Zoo is already in the quantum field, and it can record down into the infraparticle into the infraparticle range. Which is which is uh, uh, the the very very small, and um, you know if you look at um, you know uh, not and much past the nanometer scale, you know if you look at the nanometer scale, you know a uh, uh, an is like five million nanometers. The head of the, the head of a pin is like a million and a half nan- nanometers, and you know. Um, if you deal with uh, the the nanotech which we have in our phones and things like that, uh, uh, a nanometer is ten to the negative nine, nine, and a picometer is ten to the negative twelve. A femtometer is ten to the negative fifteen. A atometer is ten to the negative eighteen. A zeptometer is ten to the negative twenty-one, and the octometer is ten to the negative twenty-four. And Planck length is ten to the negative thirty-five, and I'm pretty sure that the Yiming Zoo are working at the atometer range, which is 10 to the negative 18. That's that's small. That's be, uh, that's beyond <laughs> the quantum almost, you know. So it has the ability to, um, in just part of its memory field, take, you know, say the 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 head of a pin. That much. That much information inside of a Yiming Zoo would there's more information in that head of a pin on a piece of Yiming Zoo than all the atoms that exist in the universe so these things are actually transdimensional and they breach the definitely um, no the doubt information about yeah. no doubt no doubt about that yeah. no doubt about that you know for sure you know Sure. Yeah, so that yeah. so that's what I'm I'm dealing with. I, and I look at it, you know, you were saying about in Star Wars where um the kind of like hologram came out, but see it's a uh uh a all inclusive experience it's out of. It's not just a hologram comes up, but you're actually you're embedded in the energy field, so it brings where it has collected information to the actual feel that you're that you're existing in at that moment when you were in the imperial city and people walking by and you know things like that that you were you were actually there and that's there. what i'm trying that's what i'm that's trying, that's trying to that. yeah that's what i'm trying to to deal to deal with because like i said i've been taking it into trips which is you know um you know and it's 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 moving right there with me so now um i don't even actually have to take it it's part of my uh, my weaponry, kind of like in the whole thing of uh, when, when uh, you know, you're talking about, uh, say, uh, Krishna when uh, he was um, giving information to Arjuna about his, you know, his uh, higher self and what he actually was, not the human portion of it, which we, you know, he was he was talking to, not the human being, when he gave him the soma, which was the mushroom drink he said what you know what's going on here what is this you know what's what's really happening and he said hey do you want to you you really want to know what's going on (laughs) and he said yeah i want to i want to know what's going on so he revealed to him his trans-dimensional forms 
and all their and all their mystery. So it had uh, divine weapons and uh, you know because most people don't know that the the weapons of uh, the weapons of Krishna were uh, the 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 mace, the conch shell, the lotus flower, and the Sundansara chakra, which was the uh, which were his main weapons, and so the energy field that he invoked in all of those different faces and all of those different things that he was revealing, he had all different type of energy fields and things like that. And I'm sure he had a, had the Imperial transdimensional Yiming zoo along with him. So um, that's what well, that's I'm, the, that's that's what I'm the, dealing with. That's the jewel of the Lotus. They call that Om Mani Padmi Om. That Mani, that Mani is the Yiming Jew. Om Mani Padme Om. That Mani, that's the jewel in the lotus. That's the yes, jewel. Yes, definitely. You know, there's, a, there's quite a, a large uh, Tibetan community, t- Tibetan Buddhist community here in uh, Taiwan. And I've been able to uh, spend some time with the, uh, the head Rinpoche here. Yes. Because they, they're they venerate Padmasambhava, who is a celestial who figures prominently in their history. Yeah. He's actually uh, appeared, you know, back in the, I think, the 8th century. And his, his, his legendary feats and accomplishments are well documented. But he had three Yemen Jew in his crown. So the Tibetans are quite familiar with the image, which you call Nishin Norbu. And when I showed him my image, he kind of chuckled because they're focused on the image inside of them, inside of their consciousness, yes. rather than the image you can hold in your hand. Well, I think I think uh, I think that the one that you can hold in your hand is just the coming back of the reflection of what's already there. That's why I was saying uh, when you, when you get a uh, Yaming Zhu, you're not getting something that is foreign to you or doesn't, you know, or isn't a part of your reality. It's your Yaming Zhu. It's just an external form. Since we live in this three dimensional five sense reality, it's an external form of what you've already had. And I say this to people who, 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 who get the Yiming Zoo, that you're, you, this is your Yiming Zoo. You've always had it. It's just here showing itself for you in this dimension as uh, something external, when it's really something that you've always had and you've, all, you, you, you've never been without it. Now, that's deep. That's well said. That's deep. That's well said. You know, because I know I know that the the ones I've had, I have, I've always had. You know, I'm in the I'm in the the, the hyperdimensional zones, and all I have to do is think of it, and it's and it's there. You know, within my uh, within my within my field. You know, just like my the weapons and things like that I have, they then all not always visible, but all I have to do is be in a situation where it's needed. It's kind of like the, the light of Elendril, which uh, in the Lord of the Rings, um, Frodo was gifted by the elves. It said it's a light where all others fail. You have this light. So once when, when I was, um, when I was in uh, dealing with the djinn and I was trapped in a puzzle and I went below the plank length, um, plank length, as I said before, is 10 to the negative 35. And at 10 to the ne- negative 35, there is no light. It's triple thick darkness. And the reason why is it's under the photon. It's, it's smaller than the photon. The photon is orders of magnitude above that. So there's no, no photon to be able to, to, to be light in that place. And the only light that I could, the only light that I have to be able to see and to navigate in that triple thick darkness was the Yi Ming Zhu that lit up in my field of, uh, in, in my field, and gave me a, a way of navigating, in a place where the physicists say that this is the, 
they, they say this is the end of the line, but of course, it's end of the, the end of the line for their calculations and their mathematics. It's not the end of the line. It's actually the beginning. But there's no light. There's no physical light down there. <laughs> and the only thing that you, only thing that you, <laughs> only thing that you had that lit, that lit this place up was the was the evening zoo. And they, <laughs> and 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 those that exist in that place, because it's a it's a. Uh, a greater density because of the closeness of the of the particles at that at that spot. They're so close together because we know that atoms and things like that are basically empty space. There's space between them, but these particles at at that level of existence are so close together that the speeds that we're talking about the the density of information is so vast that is is you can't even imagine it. You have to you have to be there. That's why I say that the, the servers that generate the reality of the macroverse exist in the infraparticle realms, which is below the ten to the negative thirty five. And I know that I've been there. And the only light that I had in that place, because you have to bring your your vision with you have to bring something your vision with you. And the the Yi Ming Zhu um, was my vision down there when I got stuck in the basement. You know, because I, I call it the basement. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's but, that, very, but that that's definitely, really interesting. definitely. Yeah, you there? Are we still connected? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're still. I said that's. I said that's very interesting. There's a a deity that's highly venerated in 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 Taiwan. Did you hear that? Are we still connected? We're still, we're still connected, but I think they've and they maybe some 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 That's very interesting. I hear you. I understand. Yes. There's a deity, a Bodhisattva, who is the god of Yemen Jews, named T. San Pusa. And he holds in his hand a glowing Yemen Jew by which he illuminates the underworld. And his vow, is, is like his job, is to help lost souls find the light. And he's always depicted holding a glowing aiming Jew. Well, that's what it is. The light where all others fail. The goddess Kuan Yin Pusa, who is also a bodhisattva, also an enlightened celestial being, holds in her hand a glowing gleaming Jew. You find many deities, many what they call uh, uh, Shien or immortals, are yes. depicted holding gleaming Jews. They're very, very fond of gleaming Jews. And when I got my first gleaming Jew, I started having... Um, Visitation, because the image you functions as a kind of a transponder or a beacon. So the higher dimensional beings, it's got to be a very very bright. Oh yeah. And I've been, and I've over the last uh, God, it's almost ten years now, nine years. I have met quite a few uh, Shians. Uh, and it's 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 interesting that the original name for Taiwan, which is my home, uh, my home base now, uh, is where my business is based and where my uh, my research is focused because there's so many Yemen Jew here and so many people who love them and collect them and cultivate them. But the original name for Taiwan is Penglai Xiandao. 
And there's two, according to Taoists, there's two places on Earth where the heavenly realm and the terrestrial realm intersect. Yes. That's Mount Kun, Mount Kunlun, K-U-N-L-U-N, and that's in Tibet, near Tibet. And and Mount Penglai, Penglai, which is Taiwan. And so it means Island of the Immortals, Penglai Xiandao. And this really is the Island of the Immortals. The, the people here venerate these uh, Taoist uh, uh, deities. They pray to them. They make offerings to them. They have uh, altars to them in their homes and their businesses. It's ubiquitous. And because they're giving so much energy and acknowledgement to these beings that exist in a higher vibratory realm, yes, they provide the uh, the fuel or the you know the 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 the, the, uh, the the juice required to make the connection between that realm and this realm. And there's so many. I'd heard about this before I came here, but I've experienced it since I've been here. There are so many accounts of people that, who are very, very devout and very, very sincere in their internal practices and their meditation and their prayers that they have uh, if you can if you if you become part of the, the the Taiwanese community, you'll start to hear these stories more and more where people will actually have interface and interaction with these deities, where they'll physically manifest and, and hang out with you. But they're able to be, to bestow tremendous blessings. I come from a family of medical doctors and research scientists and scholars. My mom's a doctor, my dad's a doctor, my older brother was a doctor. I studied pre-med at Stanford. I'm I'm a, I'm pretty much I'm pragmatic. I'm very skeptical. I want you to prove it to me. I want to be seen. I want you to show me. Then if you show me, show me how it works, and I can work it. Then I'll okay. Then I'll go. I'm not just going to believe something because somebody says so. And I've had the experience since I've been here, and it's pretty much something I'd want to have everybody have a chance to experience. That the Yaming Jew truly attract multitudes of blessings, and and uh, whenever I hand a Yaming Jew to someone, I always say healthy, wealthy, happy, lucky, because they not only will increase your vitality and your your energetic state of of, of, of strength and grounding, they have an ability to help you increase your manifestation abilities. And then they will attract these heavenly beings. And it doesn't matter if you are Chinese or not, if you're Western or not, because these deities, they're kind of transcend culture. They transcend race. I think they clothe themselves according to your, to your frame of reference. But whoever they are and our, however they really exist is in a higher order, on a higher realm. It's be, it transcends. Oh, yeah, definitely it transcends the, the um, usual suspect plenum of information that we have um, in this realm, you know. The, the, the mystery because, is, because is just that the mystery, yeah. Because Yemen Jew are found everywhere. Everywhere on earth, they find Yemen Jew. They find Yemen Jew in a, I have Yemen Jew from America, from Colorado. They find Yemen Jew in some of the greatest uh, mineral uh, uh, discoveries. There was one in Darby in the 1870s. A fluorite mine was uh, discovered. It had this very beautiful purple fluorite that when exposed to light, they would glow brilliantly for 72 hours. The people didn't realize it, that's a Yemen Jew. Mm. See, but Chinese have recognizing what they, recognizing that there's something, there's a sentience there, there's a, there's a, there's a consciousness there, and interacting, revering them and interacting with them 
for millennia, where other people will, would find it and say, oh, this is interesting. Oh, this is, it glows in the dark and just move on. You know, there's a, uh, there's a television program I would, I would want the listeners to take a look at. You can check it out on YouTube. It's a uh, television show produced by the Weather Channel called Prospectors. Prospectors. First season, second episode near the 30 minute mark in this episode there's a guy named Rich Frederick who is a he's kind of like a he's really got a knack for finding uh, for finding crystals and his favorite haunt for hunting crystals is near Lake George which is very famous for its aquamarines topaz and other gemstones there's a there's a quartz-bearing vein called a pegmatite that reaches up through the surface during, around this area about 150 miles west of Denver, Lake George. And they find Amazonite and smoky quartz and a lot of other things, but it's, it's just mineral rich. Yeah. And he's digging underneath a – he's digging in a hollow beneath a tree that got struck by lightning. And he's in the hole, and he got the camera in there, and he's got his dog. He's kind of like a, he's like some like a what we'd call like a hillbilly, but I don't mean to, I'm not trying to just to, to to disparage him because I have the greatest respect for this guy, but he's kind of just like a country boy, and he just he's digging in the ground underneath. He's just got this six, he's got this sixth sense of finding for finding crystals, and he's digging with what, what looks like a, a chopstick, it's bamboo, because you don't want to use something that's gonna be harder than what you're looking for to so yeah, damage yeah. a crystal. So he's digging in this pocket in this earth, slowly, slowly, slowly underground, and he finds this pocket of fluorite. And he pulls one of the fluorites out and he kind of uses his pant leg and he, he just to get the mud off, he can see that it's got this beautiful kind of like violet, you know, Cerulean blue color, really beautiful crystal. And so they show him finding this pocket of, of, of fluorites in the field. And then at the end of the show, they show them once they've been cleaned up. And they have this man come in at the end of the show, and he's, he's got this, he's kind of like a, he's the expert on appraising minerals and, uh, and uh, identifying what they are and what their value would be in the marketplace. And so Rich shows him these pocket of fluorites that he's found. This is Prospector's first season, second episode, right at the end. And he, he shows this one, which he thinks is the pick of the litter. It's like the, it's the best. He says every pocket's going to have one prize. And this is what he thinks the prize. And it looks like, it looked like a deck of cards stacked on top of each other was, is kind of offset, like on a diagonal. So it's like two-tiered, like a step. And it's this beautiful violet, purple, bluish, almost trans, you know, translucent, almost transparent fluorite crystal. Beautiful. Yes. And he says, Rich, this, this is a great one. I think this is worth about $5,000. And these guys, because he, he found it for free, so he's happy. Five, five grand, that's a lot for, for a crystal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he says, well, there's, he says this other one, and it's kind of unusual, something unusual about it. And so he, he flicks off the light. And here it is. It's about the size of a baseball. It's got this beautiful cobalt blue light, brilliant light glowing in the dark. Yamings you. But the, the guy doesn't recognize what it is. So he turns the light back on. He takes a look at it. He says, oh, Rich, this is a polymorph. So it's a green fluorite and a purple fluorite of two different crystal forms growing together. So you got a green and a purple fluorite growing together to form a, a single mass, two different crystal structures, a polymorph. It glows in the dark brilliantly for eight hours with a blue light. Mm. And so he says, "Well, this is a polymorph, and he's got this photo. He's got this, uh, you know, luminescent quality to it." And he, but that wasn't the important thing to him. That it was a polymorph that was important. He says, this is about $5,000 as well. And 
I took a look at that and my jaw dropped because what he was holding in his hand was a priceless, authentic Yaming Jew. Mm. Probably worth $10 million. And so as soon as I saw that, I went online to try to find this guy to see if I can acquire this from him since he didn't know what it was. And he <laughs> sold it a few weeks earlier at the Denver Gym Show for $5,000. So whoever got that score, that's a find of a lifetime. <laughs> now that's a national treasure. So the but human it's Jewel possible found, that they don't know what it is. They possibly they don't know what it is. They didn't know what he didn't know what it was. So, so yeah. see, the Chinese know what they are. In the West, they don't know what they are. And so that's how I've kind of built a business because I know what they are. So I'm able to find them. It's like, you know, if you don't know what it is, and I do, then that's, that's I win. You know, it's like that's how it works. And so if you don't know. Yeah. But nobody knows. Only the Chinese know, and they didn't. Chinese keep things secret. They, kept, they had acupuncture since 2,500 years B.C., whatever, the Yellow Emperor. And we just found it about yeah. acupuncture in the 1960s, right? They had now, Qigong for like, since forever. And they were just finding out about Qigong. And they had Yeming Zhu since the Shang Emperor, since the first d- dynasty. But we're just now finding out about Yeming Zhu in 2010. Yeah. So one, keep, one question so I wanted, that, to, that, wanted to ask you. Um, now, now, I had a guy that, was, that, that wanted to, to purchase a Yeming Zhu. And he said, well, you know, tell me a little about it and I'll do a little research. And so I told him about it and said, do a little research. And when I came back uh, to, to uh, deal with the purchase, he said, well, I don't think so and things like that. But I found out that he went on the Internet and he bought one for like $40. Um, of course, it wasn't authentic, but he was uh, you know, satisfied. So there, there are people out here that, are, that have... Uh, fake gaming zoos that aren't really oh, yeah, well, authentic. And of, course, of course, yeah. The marketplace is, is flooded with fakes. And the trouble with the fakes is, is they don't have a coherent crystal structure. So you can't... So they won't activate. They'll glow. And they won't, yeah, Just don't have the information. Yeah, they don't... Exactly. They don't... They don't they, all they do is glow. You can't interact with them energetically. They're not going to bring you any any of the blessings, any of the trans-dimensional, hyper-dimensional capability is absent because there's no coherent crystal structure. All they are is a an aggregate of chemicals that have been yes. hardened. And some of them can be quite toxic. And one of the easy ways of finding out if something is real or fake is to muscle test it. Because authentic yeah. gaming jewel will make you, make you so strong. It will it'll increase your strength. Like you, it's, like, it's like night and day. It definitely will increase your strength and in your, in your coherence. And so when I muscle test people, when I find people that, uh, that have uh, fake gaming jewel, I'll have them take the image you off and I'll muscle test them. I'll have them put their arm out and I'll try to push down and have them resist. And then I'll have them hold their yaming Jew with one hand at, next to their solar plexus. And all of a sudden I'll push again, their arm will drop. They'll lose all their strength. Then I'll hand them an authentic aiming Jew that has a crystal structure, a coherent crystal structure. And, I'll, and I, I can hang on their arm and, I, and they can't get it to drop. It's, yeah. it's it's not yeah. even it's so dramatic, and uh, the but the mo- what's even more important is I was talking about this phenomena phenomena of activation is that Yemen Jew once you start to meditate with it and and wear it and interact with it and and to fill it with your consciousness and to boil your consciousness down into the center of the crystal. Once, you ha- when it, once it is sufficiently infused, they will physically transform. On the process towards activation, the aiming you will gradually glow brighter, 
longer, and the glow color will start to change. We will start to see different the the overtones when it's when it's an afterglow. We'll start to notice different colors will start to appear. That many many people have experienced this. So yeah, at, what after at, after at, information at release? Point, at some point, when you get sufficiently, when your consciousness and the consciousness of the Yemen Jew, which is a zero point in you, and the zero point in the Yemen Jew get in sync, the Yemen Jew will awaken. It's like when a human being awakens, they get like the nimbus, you know, like the Buddha and the, 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 the saints. Yeah. They have, the, they have the, the, the halo around their head. The Yemen Jew will awaken. It will enlighten. It will open up. And it will, for a time, become transparent. An opaque Yemen Jew becomes transparent. And then it will, eat, then it will exude a golden plasma. This golden light will come out of the Yemen Jew. And my, I told you when I first was experienced this imperial back in June 20th, 2010. After I handed the Yemen Jew back to the, you, its its owner, he told me about this process of activation. And when you meditate with the Yemen Jew for 45 minutes to an hour, when you open your eyes, you'll see your body covered with this golden plasma. The image you will have a golden plasma around it, and the, and the golden plasma will be covering your entire body. He says that. Yeah. He says that's that's your energy body, and that's where you direct the healing power of the image from, because he uses the image to heal. Yes, that's one thing that we but, we definitely have to 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 talk about and deal with. You know. Fake, Fake image you do not have a coherent crystal structure. They can't activate, so there's no golden plasma. That's like that's the name of the game is the activation. You want the gold. This golden plasma is the elixir of life. This golden plasma, they call it in, in Chinese. What is the name for it? Is Jin. Uh, uh, Did you see? Did you see? The, did you see? Well, while you're thinking, did you see the um, Avengers: Age of Ultron? No, I didn't the movie, see the it. Movie? Oh, okay. Well, if you can get it on Netflix or something like that on your phone or computer, take a look at that. It's a point in there where they're looking at um, Jarvis, which is Iron Man's uh, artificial intelligence that runs his armor and all that kind of stuff. And then there's there was Ultron. Um, okay. And they had them side, and they had them side by side, showing their informational structure as far as uh, what would be called the 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 transdimensional neural links. So if you get a chance to All if right. you get a chance to see the Age of Ultron, and <clears throat> what happened was is that um, the Infinity Stone, uh, and I believe it's the Mind Stone. Uh, was one and it was, I believe it's, it's either purple. I think it's purple or gold um, was utilized for the vision and the vision carries uh, it organized uh, a humanoid structure for um, this being to, uh, to be part of. And he's called a vision and the vision carries his uh, infinity stone right in his forehead. Um, I think that'd be good to see just to kind of, you know, look at and see some of the things that we're, we're already talking about um, in, you know, in a, in, in part of the Marvel cinematic universe, you know, because they're going whole, uh, they're going in on um, February, the, uh, the Black Panther um, with the vibranium, which is, you know, the, uh, really, Sagala, which is the metal of the Dogun, the super metal from Sirius, which they're talking about as far as Wakanda is concerned, and then the um, Infinity Wars, which are the wars for the different Infinity Stones, which Doctor Strange has one, the Collector has two, one is in the forehead of Vision, um, and these these six stones that are actually six singularities from before the universe that 
mm-hmm. Thanos is trying to get to put in his in- Infinity Gauntlet, which is the glove that holds these six different Infinity Stones, and they're each a different color, and each have different information. One is the Time Stone that deals with time. That's in the Eye of Agamotto, which is the talisman that Doctor Strange carries. That is the eye. There's the um, time stone behind that, which he uses to manipulate time. Then there's the mind stone. Um, then there's the the um, you know they're, they're different. Exactly, Yi Ming Zhu's. You know, so if you get a chance, look at um, the Avengers: Age of Ultron. And I think you'll get a, a lot of mileage out of the of, of what they're doing. Thank you. So I, will. The, I will. Yeah. So the the Yi Ming Zhu are are um really something when you when you really get to work with them, you know, um, not just take well, them and send them in the drawer somewhere. They, but, they come in different glow, they come in different glow colors as well. My first Yi Ming Zhu was green. Yeah. And uh, when I. After my experience on the golf course in December 1st, 2009, I had a, a green Yemen Jew. And I had heard that the Yemen Jew also came blue and purple. And I set out, I, I call it following the Dragon's Trail. And I spent from 2009 to 2012. crisscrossing China. I spent a lot of time in, uh, in the southwest and in the northwest. I was living in Dali and Dijang in the search of the blue and the purple. And I was actually able to finally to find, I remember when I found my first purple, I just, just couldn't, couldn't believe it that it actually existed. I Once I acquired my blue and purple, and all the others I'd found along the way, I took them to Beijing to show to a professor emeritus at Beijing University who wrote the first book on Yemen Jew, but in Chinese. A professor, Luan Bing Ao, who then was in his 80s. He was a, a PhD in, or a professor emeritus, PhD in history and archaeology. But he had gone back into the historical record and documented all the references of the Yemen Jew from the Shang Dynasty all the way to the end of the Qing. And he introduced me to some people who were able to test my Yemen Jew. And I was shocked to discover that only two of the pieces I had were minerals. And that much of what I had was synthetic. Mm-hmm. And during that first trip, he introduced me to three gentlemen who are known as the fathers of the Amy Jew. One is a professor of uh, a, a PhD in particle physics, who I call the poet. The second is a gentleman I refer to as the healer who's a PhD in crystallography and material science. And the third is a PhD in chemistry who I call the alchemist, who actually made, figure, figured out how to make Yemen Jew. So many of the Yemen Jew that I had, this man had actually made. And this is some very sophisticated alchemy. Because they were able to, through the phys- physicist, broke the, he figured out the, the physics of how you need to glow, glowing feature, the forbidden zone. The professor uh, um, of crystallography figured out the crystal structure, and and the chemist figured out the, co- the component constituents and how to grow it, and they actually grew the crystal that had the same energetic capability as the ancient imperial that I'd held in Taiwan, but it's tw- they were twice as hard and affordable. And so he's yeah. what they call he's a modern Yemen Jew. There's ancient Yemen Jew, which 
there's very, very few. And you have to be basically a royal or a tycoon in order to have one. The normal person is never going to see one. They're not in any museum. The ones that exist are very closely held by very wealthy elites. It's the family treasure because it's so valuable. It brings so much blessing to the family. You would never know they had it. Yeah. And then you have the modern Yemen Jew, which has the crystal structure, coherent, coherent crystal structure, and then you have the fakes. So the modern Yemen Jew comes in, the basic colors are the purple, the blue, and the green, which are like the, the you said, mind stone, the time stone. Yes. And then they are also are able to make it in gold and orange and red. So the same colors as the Infinity Stones in the Marvel Universe are actually physically exist as modern image you. But there's only one man who figured out how to make it. He's got the patent. He patented it in 1998, 1999. He has the patent in the U.S. and internationally. He figured out how to do it. It's very difficult to do. But it's done. And they activate it. Mm, yeah. Uh, the, the, um, well, I, I definitely like to, to at least uh, at one point in time see one of the Imperial ones, but I know they keep them close at hand. You know, do, does anyone know what happened to the uh, the ones uh, back in the time when they sacked the um, uh, the Forbidden City? What happened to those? Are they just in collections somewhere around the world and extremely wealthy people's houses and collections and things like that? Or um, the the forty eight the forty eight Ming and Qing Dynasty Imperials were hand carried to Taiwan in nineteen forty eight by General Chiang Kai Shek by his entourage. Yes, and those. 48 are registered in a they're inventoried and recorded in the Republic of China asset so they're considered in Taiwan an asset of the Republic of China and those Yemen Jews were, were given to the, the heads of the royal families or the elite that came from China with Chiang Kai-shek. So in 1948, they were bought from China to Taiwan. The Yeming Jew that belonged to the Dowager Empress, she had nine Yeming Jew, Sushi, Sushi. She had a phoenix crown. She had nine Yeming Jew in her crown. So when she walked around the palace, she had Yemen Jew on top of her head glowing, small Yemen Jew. And when her tomb was looted in 1928, she was laying on a bed of, of, of shards. They call, it the, they call it peacock jade. So when they find the deposit of Yemen Jew, some of it they'll form into spheres, but then the, you know, the bits and pieces left over, the shards, the, the remnants, yes. they yes. still glow. They were. She was laying on a on a on a on a bed of the Yeming Jew, according to the historical record, and those are, you know, those are out of sight. But those are those are, are from, the, from from what my research has shown. Those are still in China. When the uh, in the in the last few years, the Yeming Jew that was in the crown of. Uh, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan, when he unified the nine uh, kingdoms into one back in the 12th yeah. century, he had a Yeming Zhu called the Nine Dragon Pearl that was golden. It was a yellow Yeming Zhu that glowed gold. That appeared in the 1980s and was, uh, that appeared briefly in Beijing and was, it, it was exhibited and then it was, it was, uh, it was sold at auction. 
and mm. some of the uh, and four of the pearls that belong to Su Shi, which the 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 last emperor of China was named Pu Yi. Yes. He wrote in his autobiography. He mentioned her nine dragon pearls in her crown. And and four of those appeared in in 1990, and uh, and were given to the Chinese government. But rather than go into a museum, of course, they're they're too valuable, so they go into the homes of well, you know, the the shot callers, because yeah. they mean you were known to bring great wealth and great blessing. So those are something that someone would want to keep to bless their family rather than to put it in a museum where it would be, it might get stolen or people wouldn't appreciate it. So there's no Yaming Jew in any, there's no of the historic pieces. There are no Yaming Jew in any museum anywhere in the world. You can't see them. Yes. I was lucky enough to photograph two from, of these 48, but they're, they're not for public. Uh, you know, you can't. A, a normal person is not going to be able to see them. There are museums in China. There's two mineral museums in uh, near Huangzhou where they have giant yin and Jew that are like five and a half feet in diameter, four and a half feet, oh, one, yeah, four and a half feet, one, five feet. Massive. Yeah, I saw the picture. And, yeah. and I, I went uh, last year to take a closer look at these. And there's a, because that region of China is very famous for its fluoride mines. So you find a lot of the aiming Jew that are made of fluoride. But you find like the Hope Diamond that the Queen of England has. Yeah. That's the aiming Jew. That, that glows in the dark. All the, most of the legendary diamonds through history uh, are aiming Jew. They glow in the dark. They have their rare earth phosphors. So it's not just fluoride that makes yaming Jew. But those yaming Jew in China, there's uh, there's one in Wuyi at a fluoride museum that had been, it was, they took a fluoride sphere and they coated it with a phosphorescent paint and then put a clear lacquer, a, a clear coat over that to try to give it a yeah. depth of field. But if you authentic aiming you authentic imperial, when you hit it with a UV light, there'll be a subsurface scaling pattern that is unmistakable. It looks like a, like a field of wheat or grains of rice laid end to end. It's a very unique scaling pattern that is revealed under ultraviolet light. So I, I wonder what would happen. And I, and I kind of hopped over the little barrier and I had my light taking a close look. And I, uh, I busted their chops when I informed them that I knew that what they had was fake. But there was a big draw. They were using it as a big draw. They were selling, they had that, as, that was fake. And then their gift uh, shop, they were selling small. Peter, uh, 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 Peter um, yeah. this has been so, uh, it's, it's been so fascinating. But the thing is, is that we, we run out of time. We got to do part two. This is just, uh, okay. it's almost, <laughs> the show's almost over. They, I was, uh, I hadn't been keeping up with the time and the, the computer says your show is 90 seconds. <laughs> so okay, I'd like well, to. I'm sorry. I'm so long winded. And, and uh, thank you for having no, me no. As, as a guest. It says, first guest it, says, it, says, <laughs> it says 60 seconds, but we'll, we'll talk and we're going to, um, we're, we're going to do let's part do two that's because that's we just cracked the, cracked the, crack the surface. It'll probably have to be, um, let's see. I'll, 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 I'll get with you and let you know. Because I may All be right. uh, Listen, uh, doing some traveling. Well, thank you very but much. Clint. Thank you very Good much for being voice. on there. Was... Our, our first, our first guest and um, people. This is fascinating. I apologize to you too because we didn't get a chance to 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 talk to anybody else. But this subject is something that we really need to uh, to go into. Um, if you're interested in the Yiming Zoo, you can get me on my email. Just email me, and we'll we'll work through it. That's kalindi at hotmail dot com. That's k i l i n d i at hotmail dot com. And also, if you like the show and you'd like to contribute to it continuing, you can get me on uh, PayPal for a donation from ten to ten thousand, or a hundred thousand, or a million, whichever way you want to do it. But ten is fine at kalindi at hotmail dot com. That's my PayPal uh, address. So thank you all for 
uh, coming in on the show. I really appreciate it. And let's thank and give a, a big hand to uh, Peter for coming on. And we're going to do part two. Thank you very much. All right. The Entheogenic Explorer show is signing off. <laughs> and uh, we'll be we'll be talking soon, brother. Peace. All right. Thanks, brother. Peace. Thank you.